While it may be long overdue and the holiday season is long and gone, but the return of one of the most underrated shows on Netflix is just beginning. Hey guys, it's Kevin and Marvie for something that I've been wanting to review for a very long time to you guys. As you guys know, back in December um, of last year, there was a supposed Sense8 Christmas special that was going to come on. And if you guys know me, you know I am a huge fan of Sense8. I think it's one of the most underrated shows on Netflix. It's a show that kind of came out in 2015 and not a lot of people talked about it. And uh, it's quite disappointing because it's a very entertaining show. I really did love the first season just so many great themes of um acceptance and identity and all kinds of really cool elements uh, just combined together uh, and just the premise in general was just something I, I ate up really uh, a lot and just a really well done character series again I don't think enough people really do watch um, so obviously I was hyped for this Christmas special. I definitely just, I was just happy to get more Sense8 stuff. I didn't really know what this was going to be. Um, and to tell you guys the truth, yes, this obviously did take me a very long time to watch because finally I am reviewing it. Uh, it's no longer called Sense8 Christmas special. It's now called Happy Fucking New Year. And the weirdest thing about this is that, uh, this is now listed as the first episode of Season 2, which I don't think was intentional. I think they expect this to be like sort of like a Gilmore Girls a Year in the Life thing or what happened with the BoJack Horseman Christmas special where this would just be separate on Netflix and not an actual part um of the series like when you go to the series on Netflix this would not be part of it but now it is and it's listed as the premiere I'm just going to call this season two episode zero because this isn't the actual premiere because let me just say that for a premiere this is extremely misleading I mean it really is um this special in general, I don't think is bad, but this show has definitely offered us a lot better. I definitely will say that. I think this special is quite messy. It's a very, at, at least for the first half, it's very all over the place. It's way too long, but it does have a lot of interesting stuff in there that I think does overall set stuff up well for the season. Um... But it definitely is a little bit weaker, and I think a little bit more unfocused uh, than some of the other Sense8 stuff we've gotten. But let's just get into this, because I, originally I didn't really know if I was going to review this thing, because I didn't know if it was going to connect to the overall season. But in fact, it does, and uh, we're going to get right into it. So, we start off and we see across the world, the members of the Cluster are going on with their lives. We see Kala, she dreams of being with Wolfgang, and this scene, again, it just really threw me off, because again, I expect this to be like a Christmas special, and no, this essentially is like the premiere. Uh, we see basically what everyone's been doing. She's, you know, having these, she wants to be with Wolfgang. Obviously, we know they have that connection, and Sun is pacing in her cell. We know she's now in prison. Uh, Nomi is kissing Neats, and Wolfgang drinks in a bar. Kala then swims in the Mediterranean. She boards the boat to greet her husband, Rajan, where they're honeymooning in Italy, and uh, I was surprised to see that she's actually continuing to be with Rajan, but it seems that things are kind of going well with them, but Riley keeps drugging Will so that Whispers can't find them, and we didn't know what was going to really happen, Will. As we know, way back in the, um, you know, finale, which seems like so long ago, because it really was, um, it was like, back in August of 2015 was the last time I reviewed the show, which is pretty crazy, but, um, as we know, Will was constantly seeing these visions of Whispers, and Whispers almost killed Riley, so she just says to keep drugging him so that way Whispers uh, can't find them, because obviously Whispers wants to go over the entire cluster, specifically Will he's in pursuit of right now, and uh, obviously Riley has to do what she can to protect him, or else Whispers is just gonna fucking kill him. So I did think this overall was a really good start. Again, it does feel very much like a season premiere, and that's the thing with this episode, is that it can't really decide whether it wants to be a premiere or whether it wants to be a one-off and that's like my main thing with this special so in San Francisco, Needs reads about remote viewers, and Agent Bendix comes into the bookstore where she's working, and Needs tells him she doesn't know where Nomi is, and 
obviously he is in search of Nomi because of all the hacking and things she did. I mean, she definitely did do some very shady stuff, and she's in a lot of trouble with the government right now. So Bendix doesn't believe her, says that he knows she's recently been in contact with Nomi. He reminds her it's a crime to assist a felon, and promises that if he if uh, he doesn't put Nomi behind bars, then he's going to put Neats there. And he keeps his promises. And meanwhile, Nomi watches the exchange on the shop's cameras and checks in with Neats to make sure that she's okay. And things seem to be going okay for her. So I did like the way this was done. I thought this was a good reintroduction into their story. And again, it does show how supportive uh, Neats is of Nomi. So a guard then pushed the tray into Soon's solitary cell. I have been saying it wrong all season. I called her son. It's actually Soon. I don't know how I got this wrong, but it's Soon. She ignores it, and the guard eventually takes it out. And Soon remembers her brother saying that uh, Shane killed their father and that they still have each other. When in reality, we know her brother actually did it. And uh, she obviously doesn't believe him. She thinks that, you know, he killed her. He killed him. And obviously, we know that's true. So she keeps exercising in her cell, kicking the wall. Even when the guards point out that it's government property, she doesn't care. She's obviously very frustrated. She knows very well that she shouldn't be in jail. But because she does love her brother as crazy as he is, uh, she is trying to take the fall for him. Because again, he has a very demanding, if I remember correctly, he's a very demanding position. And she doesn't want to jeopardize that. So you can see she really doesn't want to be here. But, you know, we don't get a lot of progress within that plot. We got we get some good stuff there. But because, again, this is very much a one-off, soon does not have a lot of progression um, in her storyline, which we'll get into. But Wolfgang checks in the comatose Felix at the private hospital. He figures that he screwed everything up, and, and this time it's cost him the only thing that he really wanted. That, of course, being Kala. And they see each other through their link, but they walk away from each other. And you guys remember how compelling I found their storyline to be. And that hasn't changed. That's the one thing I will definitely say about the specials, that the things that I loved about the show, I still do love. Wolfgang and Kala, especially, I thought was very well captured here. It's very awkward between them because they do want to be together, but at the same time, it's kind of impossible because they're in two completely different locations. They're not actually physically together, but they feel all the effects of it, and it's very interesting the way that's done. So... We then see Caffius and Jayla. They were painting. They were painting on the Van Dam, and this was a very uh, interesting introduction because, as we know. Uh, Caffey is the character. I really did love Amelamine on the show, but he was in fact fired for, I believe, saying a few hateful comments, uh, towards Lana, uh, Wachowski, and also her now sister as well. So, obviously, they did fire him because of that. I heard he's very regretful of it, um, but he was just tired of having to cover it all up, and unfortunately did have to recast him. And how is this actor? Right now, I can't really say, because out of all the characters in this episode, Caffius is the one with the least amount of story progression. I, Caffius I liked in this episode, but his storyline was the weakest for me. Every time they would come back to him, I just wasn't as interested. The actor is good. He's definitely very charismatic, and he seems to really embody a lot of the character, but he does channel this character a little bit differently. Amel Amin, I think, was just a really charming, uh, charismatic guy, and this guy just seems to be a lot more fun, and uh, he's channeling more of the fun-type energy, while Amel Amin channeled a lot of the more emotional stuff, but again, that's only from this episode, which we don't see a lot of him. So again, I can't really say too much about him. But Hernando's in giving a lecture on art at the college. And this is one of the most interesting parts of the episode. He notices the students are mostly looking at something on their phones. They're snickering. And he finally asks what's going on, because they're obviously not listening. And a student then brings up a picture of Hernando and Lido having sex, taken from a tabloid. And the student asks if it's art, and Hernando asks for his opinion. And when the student says it looks like shit packer porn, Hernando says the behold Holder sees what they want to see. He then talks about what someone who can see beyond their biases would see two people in love. And it was a really well done scene. I thought it was definitely very well done. And it wasn't overly preachy. Like you can understand Hernan and Lito, they deal like th they deal with things like this all of their life. And you know, I like that Hernando is trying to teach them, you know, that they are just in love and they need to just kind of separate that. So after the class dismisses, Lido comes in, says the photos were all over the internet, just as Joaquin promised. And Hernando asks what happens next. And Leo takes his hand and says that they that here they go as they hug. And uh, you can tell that obviously now that Lido has come out, a lot is starting to follow him and obviously because of that it is starting to give very bad press and this definitely is I think is going to be one of the more interesting uh, storylines as the season goes on. 
So Wildem wakes up next to Riley, and I will admit I was a little bit disappointed with Riley in this episode, mainly because of how interesting she was in the first season. Remember, she had an abandoned child. Uh, remember, she basically was the main character of the first season in many ways. So to have her reduced to basically just be there to drug Will, uh, I just thought was a little bit disappointing. They didn't really do a ton with her here, and most of the action Will gets in this episode. Now, I love Will. I think he's a fantastic character. I think he's done a lot of great stuff with him, but I really did kind of want Riley just have a little something more going on, and they really didn't do that, and I do like that these two are together, like this isn't through the cluster, they are actually physically together, which was a really cool idea, and uh, he wakes up next to Riley after dreaming of himself and Angel in the forest, he then finds himself in an abandoned church where Angel killed herself, uh, and then both uh, shoot up, and uh, Angelica is talking about how now all she needs is what Whisper sees, and he found her just like he'll find Will, and she tells Will she has a way out, so she takes a gun, offers it to Will, Will puts the barrel into his mouth and he pulls the trigger, and he wakes up, and Riley assures him that he's safe, and then pulls him back down, so you can tell he's having these very deep... Uh, visions, we don't really know what they're all about, but obviously he knows Whispers is in pursuit of him, and through Angelica and Jonas, they're kind of helping, guiding him through, uh, protecting himself from Whispers. So, the guards then bring Soon to see her new attorney, Mr. Lee, and Lee says her former lawyer, Chen, quit because of a conflict of interest, and the lawyer thinks that Soon is innocent. Like, there's no way she could have done this, but admits that the court won't agree to a retrial now that Soon's father is dead, and unfortunately, that does not work in Soon's favor, obviously. She she wants to get out of there as soon as possible, and they can't give her a retrial now because there is no one to support that. So Lee plans to subpoena Jean and soon advises him to stay away from her brother because he's dangerous, and she wants him where she can reach him when she does get out. And yeah, obviously she wants to take him down. She wants to make sure that he is situated now, so that way, you know, when she does in fact get out, she can then kick his ass. And you definitely, th I definitely think they're they're setting that up very well. Like they're definitely setting up that confrontation between soon and June, and again, I just, they didn't really do a lot with that in this episode. They're just, it, it, she's very much still in the same position we found her in the end in the, in the, uh, in the episode, but Neats then meets with her nurse friend who says that Bendix was there again. Nomi's listening to their conversation via Neats's earbud, and Leto appears in Nomi's mind. He talks about how he's going to have to come out, and he's very afraid, and Nomi says that she'll be there for him, and she sees the paparazzi taking photos of him, and the faggot graffiti as he pulls up to his penthouse. You can really see how scared scared he is of doing this. I mean, he really did not think that he was going to be able to you know, have to come out and everything, but I like that Nomi is staying by his side, and it made sense why Nomi was the one who came to him in this vision. Obviously, Nomi can very much relate, and that's something I really did like here. So, Rajan asks Kala what's wrong. She says she feels trapped. She assures her husband that it isn't him and tries to explain about her cluster and how some of its members are trapped in prison or by their past, and Rajan says he talked to Kala's mother and told her that they haven't had sex yet, and all the cluster are furious at what Lido and Kala and the others are going through. I mean, there's just so much, you know, st shit that they're all going through, and they can't really believe it. They don't really know how to handle it all, and, uh, Daniela then tells Lido and Hernando to come to her house. Meanwhile, Kala insists that her body is hers, and Rajan asks for her forgiveness. She says she's not having second thoughts about their marriage, and they hug as Wolfgang appears next to her. So, she definitely does not want to engage in sexual contact. Uh, she wants to stay far away from that, and you can understand, obviously, that Wolfgang is the one that she would much rather do that with, but again, she can't, because Wolfgang isn't actually physically there, so again, it's a very awkward situation, and I do like the way they're very much saying this up. You can definitely tell that as the days go by, Kala is gaining more and more attracted to Wolfgang. I think this is definitely going to be a detriment uh, to her and Rajan's relationship moving forward. So, Caffius and Jayla then take the bullets out of the Van Damme. Jayla admits that he's upset that his friend won't tell him the full story about his sudden martial arts prowess. Like, where the hell did this come from? And again, to him, he doesn't know about the cluster. So, this just seems really random. And as Caffius starts to tell Jayla about the spirits, soon asks if he's sure if, you know, Jayla should really know. And Caffius tells Jayla about the cluster and how Soon's father was actually murdered. And he doesn't know why he was chosen, but he'll always be grateful. And Soon says she is as well and smiles. And Jayla actually feels like he's, like, he actually does 
um, believe him here, which I was surprised with, but Jayla actually did believe uh, Kathias in this scene. I, I didn't think he was going to, but he does. And as Neats then paints Nomi's toenails, they talk about how hot Leo and Hernando are together, and this scene was just really awkward, I have to say. I get, obviously, that they were enjoying that, but that scene in general I just thought was very weird. And Nomi sees Daniela, Leto, and Hernando, they're painting each other's toenails, and she tells Neats that they're in a safe place, that where they are, this cannot happen to them, and I thought that was definitely very well done, um, but Wolfgang then leaves his apartment he sees soon, he tells her that someone has been following him, and they both say that they're fine, so Will then sees whispers with a young girl watching two men sculling, and Jonas then appears to Will, and we get a very long expository scene, and this to me felt like it was there if someone had not seen Sensei, a lot of this episode definitely does feel the way, it seems like they very much wanted this episode to be a situation where you can watch this episode without watching any of the other ones, or if someone had not watched the first season, they could come into this episode and know exactly all they need to know. Um, which doesn't exactly make a ton of sense because people are always binging things nowadays, and I don't really understand why they really did that, uh, but this scene very much did seem like it fell into that category, because he warns that Whispers normally takes pills to appear normal and pretend to be a normal human. The pills are blockers, they keep Whispers protected, and his prisoners are isolated. So Whispers takes a pill and the connection breaks, and Will finds himself in the van that the BPO are using to transport Jonas, and Jonas warns the BPO hunts what they consider a very dangerous species, and tells Will and his cluster to be very careful. So Will says that they he keeps seeing Angela in a cabin. Jonas says that he and Angela lived there. The sensei birth actually transferred part of Angela's consciousness into her new cluster, and Jonas warns that the same thing happened to his cluster that happened to him, and it will happen to the new cluster. So the BPO officers, they drug Jonas again. Will asks him what happened to Whisper's cluster, and he and Jonas have a memory flash of Angela saying that they're all dead, Whisper's is coming, and she tells Jonas to run. So we don't know really what this is all about, uh, but I thought this was definitely an interesting scene, but again, we don't really know what exactly is going on here. It's compelling, it's just, again, I don't really think we needed all of this in this first episode. Again, it shows just how confused, um, I think that, like, again, I think this episode really is. It doesn't know really what it wants to be, and it is definitely a problem, um, within this episode. So Nomi and Needs them are continuing reading about out-of-body experiences, and Caffius and Jayla finish repairing the Van Dam, but the engine bursts into flames, and when they start it, they get out, run just as it explodes, and Jayla says that the king is dead. So the Van Dam's gone, surprisingly. I didn't think that was going to happen, uh, but the Van Dam actually does, uh, is destroyed in this episode, and the guard then brings Su Jin in to see Soon. The prisoner says that she bribed the guard to be with Soon on her birthday, and Soon then invites her to sit, and Riley then leads a blindfolded Will up to the apartment. Meanwhile, Kala and Rajan share a drink on the beach at a table. Hernando and Lito are in bed. Hernando wakes Lito up with a kiss and a happy birthday. Jayla takes Kathy, uh, Kathias to his surprise birthday party where everyone has gathered, including his mother, uh, Shiro, and Riley tells Will that her friend Vincent found her a place for them to stay, and they end up on the bed together. So, Neats tells Nomi that they're not going to let Bendix ruin Nomi's birthday, and they sneak out for a sex nick, and Wolfgang goes to a bar to celebrate. Rajan gives Kala a necklace, and... Lito lets Hernando spank him. Shiro and the others give Kathias a jacket and the keys to his new Van Dam. So, it seems that these Van Dams are just very disposable, which... Again, I just, I didn't really feel that, because we know that obviously Kathias, he made this Van Damme from watching all of those Jean-Claude Van Damme films, so to see the Van Damme are just, it's just disposable and you can get another one, just was lacking a lot of that emotional uh, foreground that we came to know with Kathias here, but again, this is a new Kathias, so I can understand why they decided to do that, but uh, Sujin gives Sun a present, Silas is in the crowd and tells Kathias they just wanted to honor him with a gift, like the gift he gave Silas's family, and after a moment, Kathias hugs him, Sujin Soon discovers that Su Jin is given a sketch of her and her dog, and across the world, the cluster mates celebrate their birthdays. Will warns Riley that they only agreed he should share in case of an emergency, and Riley says that it is an emergency and a celebration the first breath they all took. He agrees they all come together across the world, and Wolfgang hesitates when he sees Kala with Rajan, and Kala finds herself with Soon and wonders why she's there. She says that she and Rajan are going to have sex, and Soon talks about how she won her first fight. Her father forbidden her to fight in the Nationals, and afterward, her opponent, Wu Jin, visited her in the locker room, so it was an honor to be in the ring with her, and they had sex for Soon's first time, and she tells Call that sex is something to honor and enjoy, and don't do it until she's actually ready, 
And then we see Riley and Will have sex, Nomi and Nietzsche are having sex, Lito and Hernando have sex, and we basically get a replica um, of the montage uh, from episode 5, I believe, of the last season. And here's the thing, in episode 6, this was really cool, because we had not really seen something like this before, you know, this huge orgy going on through clusters and things like that, it was, it was a literal clusterfuck, like, we've never really seen something done like that before, and to see it again here, this didn't really feel like it needed to happen, in the first, in the, you know, the episode had happened, it felt very natural, like, this was all just kind of happening at the same time, it made sense why it was happening that way, and they weren't all having sex, if you remember, Will was, like, working out, uh, Nomi and Neitz were having sex, and Leo Hernando were, but the rest of the characters weren't having sex, Call was, like, taking a bath, uh, Riley was, like, doing something else, and this whole scene, it just felt like it needed to be here, like, oh, that scene was successful in the last episode, so let's just put that in here, and it didn't feel natural in the moment like it did in the first season, that's one of my problems with this special, they definitely did redo a lot of the things that happened in season one, mainly because, oh, it happened in season one, it was really cool there, but because we've seen again, it just doesn't have that same impact here, unfortunately, I just didn't really feel like they really needed it to happen here, but, we then see Wolfgang, he sets up a date with a woman via the internet, he says it's his birthday and they go off together, meanwhile Kala is preparing to have sex with Rajan for the first time, she goes to the bedroom and sees Wolfgang with the woman and he's really giving it to her at this point, like she literally walks in on them having sex and Kala says it's immortal, she walks in in shock and she then goes to Rajan, he's waiting for her in their bed, she tells him to make love to her and as she tries she keeps sharing with Wolfgang and she talks to him and all she's seeing is Wolfgang, every time she tries to get close to Rajan, she's seeing Wolfgang's face, and much to Rajan's confusion, obviously, Wolfgang's refusing to watch her, has sex with his partner, tells Kala to stop listening if she doesn't like it, and... Kala tries to leave, but all she's hearing are the woman's moans. I thought it was actually a very smart, fun choice to actually have the woman's moans be so loud, because that's all that Kala is hearing. All she's hearing is, is Wolfgang fucking this girl, and he's knocking, she knocks Rajan off the bed onto his groin, and it was definitely a funny scene. I thought it was definitely well done. The show has always handled comedy quite well. This was definitely a very fun scene. It was very awkward, but I think it definitely did represent the emotional struggle that Kala's kind of going through right now. So the next day, Leto meets the studio people, and Leto finally tells him he's not going to live a lie anymore, and he does in fact come out, and they warn him that there will be legal and career consequences, and he doesn't care and walks out. You know, this is a lie he's been living with for a while, he's tired of hiding, and I'm glad that he did finally come out here. So, Kala takes Rajan to a hospital, Dr. Salvo says that Rajan's uh, dick actually isn't permanently damaged, and he says that there shouldn't be any complications, so they should be fine, tells Kala that Rajan needs love, he wishes them love and leaves. Kala kisses Rajan, he winces in pain and asks her to stop, and after this scene, this is when this episode really does start to get good. Uh, I'd say really an hour in, that's when this episode started to feel a little bit more naturalistic. Everything before kind of felt like, oh, we're kind of catching up on what all these characters are doing, and all this kind of just happening at once, and here, this is when things do get good here, because we see Wolfgang, he meets with Serhae's wife, uh, Ike, his aunt, and, uh, Basically, she's at his tea house shop, and she says that she won't seek revenge against Wolfgang for Serhae's death, and her concierge, Fisher, gives Wolfgang a map of Berlin showing the four major criminal terrorists, and says if he comes home, then he can forestall a war between the three other crime lords, obviously because they did, in fact, hurt Felix, and Wolfgang obviously wants to enact revenge, and Wolfgang isn't interested, and he then walks off. He wants to stay out of this uh, violence as much as he can, so... Wilden wakes up, he has a flash of Angela telling him that Whispers found her, Whispers is there in Will's head and asks if Will plans to kill himself with a needle in Iceland, and Will figures that he's bluffing, Whispers says that how he, ca he cares how Will is, they appear in an interrogation room, and Will figures that Whispers hopes he'll spill something about his location, you know, so that way Whispers can find him, and Wilden notices the tan line on Whispers' finger, indicating that he removed a wedding ring and figured that Whispers is on forced leave after he screwed up in Iceland, and Whispers then warns Will that his choice will have consequence for the entire cluster and Will's friends and family, you know, including Diego, including everyone else in his family, and Riley wakes up and realizes that Whispers is there, and she gives Will a shot, Whispers asks Will if he's any different than Angela, and then he passes out, so Wolfgang is then sitting with Felix talking about Wolfgang's mother, Felix then wakes up, tells Wolfgang that he's sick of his confessionals, and Wolfgang hugs him despite his injuries, I was happy to see that Felix was actually okay here, I didn't think he would be, but I'm glad to see that they do have that friendship back, so 
Caffius and Jayla then take the new Van Dam out. They collect their first spares, three passengers, and stay on and say that they want to go back. They've all been inspired by Caffius's beating superpower and hope that the spirit of John Claude will help, will, uh, help them as well. So Leto and his lovers and return to his apartment, only to discover he's been locked out. He buzzes the landlord, Sakaro, who says that they sent a to his apartment and hangs up. Leto finally tries to break through the glass without success. Wolfgang does help him uh, short out the key lock and they go inside. And Leo discovers that the landlord has ended his lease because of moral turpitude. Uh, obviously, because of what Leto just did. Clearly, the landlord's not comfortable with it. And this is one of the most interesting storylines here. I love Leto's fighting against this. And obviously, this was wrong what he did, you know, so... I definitely did like seeing that here. So, Kala returns home. She finds her bags on the steps. Rajan tells her that he realized she doesn't want him as he wanted her. And Kala tells him not to say anything else. And they should just let the fates decide. Obviously, he knows she doesn't want to engage in sexual contact with him. And this obviously does upset him a bit. I mean, he thought she genuinely did love him. But again, remember, they were kind of forced into this marriage. Like, she never truly did love Rajan. And I still kind of believe she doesn't. I, I Truthfully, I don't think she did. It's what Sonya, um, you know, wanted. And she just kind of went along with it, but now that she does love Wolfgang, now she's really starting to move away from him, and it really starting to become a conflict here, so... Wolfgang and Felix can go to a lock shop. Felix says that he's no hero. He tells Wolfgang that it's time for him to go home and then tells Wolfgang to talk him out of it. They go drink and Felix admits that he was kidding and a bar mistress then brings over drinks, says that they're comments of one of the three remaining crime lords and the crime lord is seated across the bars and then toss Wolfgang and this scene was extremely well done. You can tell these crime lords Wolfgang is going to go after. I'm definitely interested in seeing how this is really going to play out. So at a shelter, Nomi gets an email from her sister Tegan asking her to be maid of honor at her wedding. There's a knock at the door and Nomi and Neats then hide and we see Bendix and a cop come in with the manager. They see the onion food on the table. The agent searches the place but he finds nothing and he tells the manager to tell him where they are or he'll just shut the entire shelter down. So when she refused to talk, Bendix and the cop do leave and uh, I was glad to see they are okay but you definitely get the sense this is going to be a lot of the season. Nomi's probably going to be in hiding. I'm interested in seeing really where that's going to go. So a new lawyer that meets with Soon tells her that Lee has actually retired, and he has two men with him, and Nomi and Will to mourn Soon that they're not lawyers. The security camera is powered down, and the other cluster mates realize that they're actually killers, and the young lawyer warns Soon that Joan will answer to know he's not the forgiving type. He and his men take out their weapons, explain that they'll kill Soon in self-defense, and, I mean, Soon can kick their ass with no problem, definitely. She probably could kick out both of them, but the guard is gone. Leto takes over, offers to buy them out, and meanwhile, Wolfgang helps Soon pick up her handcuffs and she takes down the three men killing the leader and that was fucking awesome i loved seeing soon get to kick ass that was one of the best elements of season one and i love that they did that here and unlike the other moments this actually did feel like it happened in the moment like obviously jean very well knows um that she plans to get her revenge and he obviously is going to try to come after her with that so i thought that was definitely really well done there but at the shelter nomi and needs then leave rather than endanger the building's financial security obviously because it's just not safe for them to be there, so Kala and Raja and then return to India, and they look in a new place, and meanwhile, Caffius is walking down the street, he sees men in suits waiting for him next to an SUV, and Nomi then takes Neats to a houseboat on the docks. Meanwhile, Wolfgang and Felix return to Wolfgang's apartment, and Wolfgang realizes that someone has broken in. He draws his gun, prepares to go in. Kala sees him standing next to her, and she looks at the manor's plunge pool, bracing herself, and she then walks away. So, a woman comes to see Riley, and meanwhile, a guard brings Min Jun into Soon cell. Min says the word has gone out of Sun putting three men in the hospital, and... Wolfgang then bursts into his apartment. He grabs a gun from the thugs waiting for him. Volker Baum, uh, one of the three climb lords, is seated, and Wolfgang tells him to get out. Obviously, he doesn't want to deal with this right now, so Nomi needs to go to a houseboat. Bug lets them in, and I love seeing Bug. I thought he was a really fun character in Season 1. I'm glad to see he's here again. He shows them the two cabins, and they take the one that isn't his, and meanwhile, Caffius and, Sh and uh, Shiro have dinner with Silas and Amandi, and Shiro says that Silas is building a clinic in the area, and Caffius figures that he'll use it to smuggle drugs, and that's the only reason why he needs it, just to smuggle some drugs. So the woman actually sells Riley some drugs, and Riley asks for laxatives, and once the woman leaves, Will warns Riley that if Whispers had been there, then he would have heard it, and Riley has bought a cell phone. You get the sense that this 
is kind of the woman smuggling drugs for them. Obviously, it's, you know, she's saying that it's for laxatives, but obviously this is the drug that is, you know, sedating Will and making sure that he does stay awake. So she says she, you know, stay asleep. So she says that she thought Will might want to call his father, and he doesn't really see the point since he wouldn't obviously understand. There's just a lot to tell him, and Min then tells Soon to do what they say, or they may never let Soon out of solitary, and Silas says he understands why Kathy is skeptical of him, but insists that he's changed. Volker explains that together he and Wolfgang could control the city. Wolfgang says he isn't interested, and Volker then leaves with his thug. Um, and again, you can tell the Wolfgang he is definitely interested in doing this, and I think Wolfgang, you know, sees him one would have done that, but because of other things that he's done, he's just not really interested in that crime life anymore, and I like the way he's trying to move away from that. So, Leto's lying in his bed next to Hernando, reading the Facebook entries on his sexuality. He tells Hernando that he's watching his career die, but it's nothing compared to his fear of his mother, Estella, and, you know, we know Estella, obviously, she's not, you know, she, she is not in favor of his sexuality and things like that, so obviously, he is very worried about that, but Michael's at home eating when Will calls. Will finally greets him and says that he just wanted to hear his voice. He warns he can't talk about where he is, and Michael tells him to get home for Thanksgiving, and Will tells his father not to believe what the government's saying about him, and it's about Sarah and much more, and when Will realizes his father's actually drinking, Michael says it will abandon him for four months, and Will says he loves him and hangs up. So obviously, he cannot tell him what's going on right now. It's just not a good time, and Riley does hug him, and their relationship is obviously very strained. I don't know if we're going to get more into that, but this definitely definitely was a well done scene. I like and see these characters spend time with their parents. This is definitely one of the best elements uh, of this special. So Nomi asks Soon if they need to consider another strategy. Soon says that Will is their strategy and then says that she needs to watch the interview with her brother Jean. And Jean then talks about how successful he's been. Then that Soon is troubled. And Soon then smashes her fists into a carryout container. And Wolfgang's in by the river drinking when Kala joins him and enjoys the, uh, the snow. And when he talks about the oil ruining it, Kala wonders why he ruins everything. Because he seems to do that. And she says there's something good inside of him while she, while she has something dark inside of her. And those really do complement each each other very nicely and we've seen that I mean we know that he did in fact save her in the finale she if I remember helped him break out so they do definitely have you know uh equal sides to them definitely and call then tells them that they have to change and be better people and Wolfgang starts to kiss her she throws snow in his face and they throw more back and forth laughing and I like that this wasn't a kiss like right now they're just trying to be friends but obviously there's a lot of sexual tension here Felix and Arise are two women sees his friend fighting with nothing and I don't know if this is going to lead Felix to think that Wolfgang's crazy, but after a while, you're gonna get the sense that he's gonna question what's going on there, but the cluster prepare for Christmas. Riley takes a blindfolded Will to the skating rink. Meanwhile, Leto takes Hernando and Indiella to Estella's home, says that she always believed in him, and when Leto hesitates to go in, Hernando tells him that he'll always be there for him. So, Volk arrives the locksmith, gives Felix a Rolex, and says that Wolfgang did the city a huge favor, and while Neitz is out, Bug tells knowing about his virtual family. Neitz then comes back, invites Bug along, and he's tough and Leto and the others then enter the house. Leto sees the tabloids on the table, and Estella comes out, says that she saved all of Leto's clippings. She learned what her friends were really like when they offered their condolences, and Leto apologizes. Estella hugs her son, says it's okay, and she assures that she's proud of him for not hiding who he is. So she actually is very supportive, and I was happy to see that, but Caveus and Shiro are then watching It's a Wonderful Life. He says he likes it, what it believes in people, and Riley and Wilden skate. Soon then sits in her cell alone when until Min brings her some Christmas treats. Rajan and Kala dance. This is all scored very nicely to the uh, Hallelujah song, which I thought was very strong. I thought it actually worked very well. This montage is just really... Um, showed how bittersweet everything was, and Estelle Lito and his lovers joined the Christmas uh, processional, and Wolfgang and Felix in exchange presents, Nomi and Neitz are celebrating with their friends, and Kathias and Shiro sit together, and the cluster mates all share their experiences with each other, the residents of Angela appears to them and smiles, and as Will and Riley then kiss, Whispers arrives, wishes Will a Merry Christmas, right when it seems like things are going to go well there, he has to arrive, he says that Will should be home with Michael, and shows Will that he's with Michael as the old man puts up his Christmas lights, Michael says that Will's a good cop and everything the government's saying about him is complete lie and Whispers pours him another drink and realizes that Whispers is actually the one getting Michael drunk which is a really well done twist. I actually like the way this was done. Michael says he just wants Will to come home. Riley injects Will with heroin to break the connection. He tells her what happened and wants if he can keep fighting and Riley says that they will beat Whispers. Even if it seems impossible because Whispers is always like one step ahead of them she will make sure that they will take him down and I definitely did like seeing that but 
The next day, Need's family invites her and Nomi to stay with them. And meanwhile, Hernando tells Estelle that New Year's is complicated for them because his parents were actually killed on New Year's. And this was a really good reveal that we found out that actually this, um... They were killed on New Year's, and that's why things were so complicated. So, Leto takes his hand, Daniela says her family is nothing like theirs. She tells him it was the best Christmas she's ever had, and Estella says that she will always be welcome into her home. And, again, it was a really nice moment. I liked the way that was done. Soon as them released from solitary, her cellmates welcome her home. And she's still obviously in prison, but she is out of solitary now. So Wolfgang Felix go to the New Year's celebration. Volker greets them. He tells them to enjoy themselves and moves on. They watch the fireworks and hug. And Leto and Hernando then clean off the grave of Hernando's parents. They place fresh flowers. They hold the hands. And Hernando says that they would love uh, Hernando Leto as well. Just a really nice scene. I thought it was really emotional overall. You can tell this is something that probably Hernando does yearly. And I thought it was just a really nice scene there. But Kala is looking out of the city when Rajan comes out. Says that things would have been different if his father died or Kala had said no to his proposal and I think she's kind of wishing that that would have happened she really does not want to be in this thing with Raja now because she is too into it with him she doesn't have the feelings that he does for her and obviously she wants to get out but now that she said yes she feels she has to honor that promise to both him and her father and now she doesn't really know what to do so Wolfgang sees Volker arguing with Fisher, says that he's starting war. Volker turns to Wolfgang and smiles, and Wolfgang leads Felix to the street so that they can join the celebration. Fisher runs them, begs for help, and Volker's men then gun him down. They then shoot at Wolfgang and Felix, who run. Felix refuses to leave Wolfgang. The two men then take cover as the gunmen arrive. Felix then gives Wolfgang one of the celebration rockets. Wolfgang then sends him to flank the gunman. They fire the rockets, and Wolfgang takes out down one man. He jumps another, uses his gun to kill a third. The first one recovers, and the gunman actually grab Wolfgang and Felix attacks to them but they actually do knock him down uh very interesting stuff there the way that was done and I thought that was just such an intense scene again we know that Wolfgang was trying to get away from them but obviously he really had no choice soon tells Wolfgang to be calm she takes over finally knocks out the gunman and it seems that he has outrun them for now the other classmates appear to Wolfgang. He wishes them a happy fucking New Year, hence the title of the episode. And that is the way this episode ends. Uh, really interesting stuff overall, but let's just get into this episode and where it's going to lead us into the season. So overall, guys, when it comes down to this episode, a bit of mixed feelings with this one. Like I said, the first 50-something minutes, I really was not into this episode, I have to say. I think it was very messy. There was a lot of things that seemed like it was just there just to get people into the show. And a lot of it felt like a repilot. Like, they were kind of doing this if people had not seen Sensei before, which was just a really strange approach. I would imagine that this was meant to be sort of like a fan thing. Like, they did this for fans, but no, it seemed like they did this as a way to to get more people on board with the show, which I get it, it makes sense, a lot of shows tend to do that in their second season, um, but this wasn't exactly the way to do that, it just felt like a very backwards, uh, sort of way to do things, like, nowadays, people will just binge the first season, I know I personally would have done that, I wouldn't have watched this episode first, and then watched the second season, that just wouldn't have made any sense, obviously, I would have wanted to watch the first season, and then get into this episode, so I didn't feel like all of that setup and all of what they did there, I didn't really feel like that was necessary, honestly, I felt like it was really dragging things on, and things like that, a lot of, like, the birthday party scene, and especially the, uh, cluster sex scene really just felt like it was there uh just for fan service and just kind of like oh you know you love that in the first season well here it is again and it just felt very forced like it just wasn't as naturalistic as it was in the first season and I didn't think it was as well done here however the second half of the episode once we actually started to get into the plot of the episode which you know mainly had to do with the characters you know what they were doing for Christmas and visiting their families and things like that I thought that was definitely very well presented um it just really took a while for this episode to figure out really what it was. Is this a one-off, you know, just a special that isn't really going to connect to anything, and maybe we'll connect to things eventually, but it's more of just a Christmas special, or is this the season premiere? It just, it really felt like this was confused with what it wanted to be, and... It has to be said, I don't think this episode needed to be two hours. I feel like it was ex really unnecessarily long. I honestly really did feel the length throughout the episode. Once it got great, it got really fucking great. And I really did start to get into it once we hit that hour mark. But 
everything before that I just felt was kind of like wasting time. It just kind of felt like they were just throwing every element of the first season into this episode, and I didn't really feel like they needed to do that. Now, let me just say, all the things I loved about the first season were definitely here, uh, such as what's going on with Will, I think is definitely very interesting, and I'll get more into predictions when we get to uh, the actual premiere. I'll talk about that stuff a little bit, you know, in the premiere and things like that. There definitely are a lot of things to talk about, you know, what's going on with Will and things like that. I thought that was definitely very interesting interesting, and especially if Whispers is going to turn his family and use them and even threaten his family, not just his cluster, but his actual family is insane what Whispers is willing to do, and I don't know how long Will is going to be able to outrun him. Uh, there's only so many times that Riley can really sedate him, um, but if this is what we're going to get in Season 2, I'm definitely excited to see where this is going to go, especially if Will can outrun Whispers. I mean, Whispers just seems like such a powerful man, um... We don't really know if he's actually going to, you know, if Will's actually going to win here. Is he actually going to get the better of Whispers? Again, we'll have to see really the way that all turns out. Um, I think the most interesting story in this episode, for me at least, had to be a tie between either what was going on with Kala and Wolfgang or what was going on with Leto. I thought those two storylines definitely were the strongest. Let's talk about Kala and Wolfgang because their storyline is very interesting. One, Wolfgang is really rediscovering himself. He's realizing he doesn't want to be a criminal. He has this more lighter side of him, and he wants to embrace it, and clearly, he does want to be with Kala, and he doesn't really like the life that he's made, he's just trying to get away from that, and just have this fun life, and just kind of move on, but all of these, you know, past things that he's done are really starting to catch up to him, I don't know if he's really going to be able to do that, and then you have Kala, who has, you know, basically been forced into marriage, and now she's really regretting even agreeing to it, I mean, I think she really wished that, you know, she even said, if Sanyam was dead, and I think Rajan really hit on the nail, really hit the nail on the head there, where, yeah, if he was dead, she would not have had to agree to anything, and she could easily just divorce him, because the only thing that's keeping her with Rajan is her father. She wants to honor that promise, she has such a great relationship with him, and I don't think she wants to jeopardize that, so obviously she does want to continue, um, things with her father, but I think their storyline is going to be very interesting. I like how conflicted the both of them are. I like how much this has brought them together. They're very compatible together. I think they are going to end up in, you know, together in the show when all is said and done. It just really, they need, they need to go about it in a certain way, and I don't really know how that's going to go. Um, as far as what's going on with Leto, is a very interesting conflict. Now, obviously, Leto has came out. There are a lot of things that have followed him. It seems that they've gotten evicted out of their house. At least they got locked out, so I don't really know where that's that's going to go. I think that's going to be very interesting. The whole thing with Nomi and Neats was interesting in this episode. They just didn't really do a lot with it. A lot of Agent Bendix searching for them. I'm sure we're going to get more of that in Season 2, but there just wasn't a lot there. And then Caffius especially uh, didn't really have a lot to do here, especially with the Van Damme and things like that. I don't really know where his plotline is going if we ha you know, if it's going to have to deal with his uncle, who he feels is in fact this, uh, this, dr you know, this druggie and he's just there to come for drugs. I don't know if we're going to touch more upon on that in the second season, we'll have to see, and then the only thing to really talk about is Soon, is Soon gonna get out of prison, obviously she knows that June knows that she is in there, and he is definitely enacting revenge, well, she's also enacting revenge, so I don't really know the way that's all gonna go, overall, guys, like I said, this was a very conflictive episode, there were some things I really, really thought were very high, um, you know, such as a lot of the things in the second half of the episode I thought were definitely very strong, but there were a lot of long, expository, drawn-out scenes that just felt like they were there uh, for people who had not seen the show before, and I just felt like a very strange approach for a show that is this, you know, uh, in season, it is in the second season, it just didn't really make sense why they decided to do that. I don't think this episode needed to be two hours at all, I think it was just way too long at that length. Uh, it wasn't even two hours, it was two hours and four minutes, which is just asking way too much out of a viewer, um, but overall, Overall, I did enjoy this episode. When it comes down to it, I'm happy to see this show is back. I was overall impressed with the way things did turn out, and I am going to give this episode a sense eight. Season 2, Episode 0, Happy Fucking New Year, a 3.5 out of 5, or a B. So, over guys, most guys saw this episode, loved your thoughts on it. I really was conflicted with how to review this episode, because like I said, some of it really, you couldn't, you didn't have much to say, and then some of it I did have a lot to say. But let me know guys saw this special, loved your thoughts on it. Did you like this premiere? Did you think it worked as a season premiere for the show? Again, the real premiere will be in my next review, which will be for the actual premiere of season two, so definitely look forward to that, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.